this episode of Sharky's Treehouse, you may not know his name, but I guarantee that you've heard his work. and toured with some of the biggest names in pop music. He's keyboardist Rob Sabino. From growing up in the Bronx and hanging out with future guitar hero Ace Fraley, to his relationship with music industry legend Nile Rodgers and playing with Chic, and all the way through to his life now as music director for his church, Robert Sabino touches on all of it. I sat down with him at his home in Northern California, and I'll tell you, I could listen to his stories for hours. He'll also perform two songs with his side gig, the Ain't Got No Time Rockin' Blues Band. So let's get to it. All right, Rob. Rob Sabino. Yes. You're the man. Yeah. You're, you're the sound of the 70s, I think. You're, you contributed to the I'm 70s. not quite there. I'm only 66. Uh, oh. I'm not the sound of the 70s. Oh, this, the decade. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Those did. were good days. That's kind of like right in my wheelhouse, the 70s and 80s. That's, yeah. I grew up listening to a lot of the music that you recorded, um, along with uh, a lot of your, your friends, Nile Rodgers, in yeah. fact. Um, let's go back a little bit before that, though, before you got a chance to meet Nile or any of those guys that you ended up becoming professional musicians with. You grew up in the Bronx. Yes. What was it like growing up in the Bronx in the late 60s, mid 60s? It was um, really interesting. It was very enriching. It was not like you would think about the Bronx. There were some rough areas, but mm -hmm. um, you know, basically a lot of my childhood was closer to Ozzy and Harriet. Really? In yeah, the Bronx? Yeah. It was congested. There were apartment houses. We, you know, we played you know, football on the streets and, you know, and uh, <clears throat> there was some, you know, some gang activity, but not like gangs now. There was gang activity like, you know, you were on my blocks playing sick ball and that's our, our block. And you're from Marion Avenue. That's where Ace is from. Oh, yeah. So he's Fraley. Yeah, so we, you know, you have fights occasionally, but not that often. And it was, it was a really nice upbringing. Hmm. Uh, I mentioned to you before we started shooting um, that I was very close to some really great parks, Marshalloo Parkway and the Bronx Botanical Gardens. Uh, and we just would go over there and get lost in the woods. The, the problem is, is that it's so big and it's certainly very congested in mm. some areas. And it also changes from neighborhood to neighborhood. Mm. You could be in this kind of almost middle class neighborhood and, um, or just low, lower, lower level poverty wise. Yeah. And six blocks over, it'd be a gang area or um, five blocks further south, and it would be a completely different ethnic mix. And another 10 blocks over, it'd be very different. Talking about that ethnic mix, does that, did that play a role, do you think, in the type of music that you listened to and liked growing up? Oh, without a doubt, sure, yeah. 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 You know, we grew up, uh, I grew up playing R&B and, uh, and rock and roll. More towards rock and roll, but everybody was into a mix back then. There weren't the divisions that, that there are now sometimes. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of... Uh, influences in our music uh we were in the middle of new york city we heard everything yeah you did a lot of uh latino music yeah yeah i'm lat i'm latino i'm my mother's from puerto rico my father's from colombia but everybody thinks i'm italian because the name sabino is an italian name okay but that goes that comes from when the sabino family came from italy to uh colombia but they were there for 300 years so they're colombian yeah yeah. You know, they're like the wasps of a Columbia. Are they? Yeah. Okay. All right. So given that background and the cultures that you grew up in um, and the, the different types of ethnicities that you were around, what music were you more drawn toward when you turned on the radio or you heard maybe walking down the street, you heard music coming out of the, the window next door or whatever? Like pop music. Pop music. Pop, pop, straight pop music. We had WA Beatles C was the big radio station. And, yeah. and the Beatles came in 64. Yeah. Um, you know, I was so hooked 
to pop music, but I love the pop bands before that, you know, the Four Seasons and uh, the, some of the duo groups and Dion and the Belmonts. Belmont, uh, Belmont uh, in the Bronx was like the, the heavy, like kind of mafia area, oh. and Dion was from that area. Okay, yeah. Uh, Belmont Avenue, if you saw the movie um, Bronx Tale, it is that, so it's a play now, it's, on, it's a live, live action play. Yeah. And um, Bronx Tale is about that neighborhood, wow. which is about eight or so blocks from me. Hmm. Did you grow up with any celebrities uh, who were either celebrities then or maybe are celebrities now that you related to? The, you know, we didn't know there were celebrities. So on the concourse, uh, Penny Marshall's mom had a dance studio. Oh. And um, which was a, a real trap. I didn't really know her yeah. at all. Or the family, but I knew people that went to that dance studio. Oh, okay. And um, later on, when I got to meet Penny Marshall, because she was seeing Art Garfunkel, and when I toured with Simon and Garfunkel, I got the chance to hang out with Penny Marshall. We talked about the Bronx all the time. It was just great. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's such a live wire and mm. such a wonderful woman. Anyway, so that's one person. Of course, there yeah. were lots of celebrities from the Bronx. Um, I can't go through them all now. Yeah. Uh, Robert Klein from the area, oh, yeah. the Dion in the Belmonts, in a few blocks away. Um, Ace Frehley grew up around the corner from me, from Kiss. So how did you how did you get to know him? I mean, was it just <clears throat> in passing or just that we were musicians? All the music, you know, it's it's like a it's a camaraderie. Everybody mm -hmm. knew who the other musicians were. Yeah. And uh, when, we, when we would hang out in the Bronx, the one thing I remember about Ace is that when we got together to like just talk, you know, hanging out in the park around some, I don't know, we must have been over 18, I'm sure, but, you know, drinking beer in the park. Oh, I'm yeah. sure we were over 18. I'm sure. And um, <laughs> we'd be sitting there, and people would say, what do you want to do? Oh, I'm going to be a musician. Oh, yeah, I want to be a musician, too. I'm going to stick with it. I'm really going to do it. I love this. And Ace was the only one who said, now, I'm going to be a star. And he was going to do it by being a musician, but his goal was to be a star, to, be a star. to do whatever it took to get with that particular group that was going to make it. And he became the first one to make it. Even before you. Oh yeah. Well, really? but he was, but he was a legitimate big artist star. I see what you mean by not becoming. Just, yeah. Yeah. Not not just a side man. Okay. Well. Uh, have you talked to him lately? Yeah, yeah, I've talked to him. Um, he's he's doing well. I, there's a big controversy about the uh, uh, kiss uh, possible kiss reunions mm -hmm. and him getting back. But he really is he really is you know part of the essence of kiss. He's part of Absolutely. their sound. And but they uh, they they had disagreements. And I uh, since I don't know the stuff firsthand, all I got all I can say is that I really liked Ace mm -hmm. and. Um, Gene and Paul were totally just very much into the business. Right, right. Yeah. It seems to me like Ace was more into the rock and roll lifestyle. Yes. Being the star that he always wanted to be. Yes. And from what I understand, Gene and Paul, they, they would do any kind of music. I think they played like folk music, yeah. you know, sitting on, uh, sitting on right. stools. Yeah. So whatever would work. Yeah. And then they were brilliant enough to come up with the idea of being comic book heroes. What did you think about that at the time? When, they, when Ace first told you or you first found out? I thought it was, you know, gimmick. But, you know, we yeah. were the kinds of kids, the kind of young musicians that didn't like gimmicks, you know? Yeah. yeah. But I really respected what he did with it. Mm -hmm. um, but they, but they were brilliant at this marketing and uh, their mm -hmm. and that particular gimmick. You know, before they had a whole lot of money, they were the, when they couldn't afford real leather outfits, they were wearing vinyl. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know they had the Ace was very much uh, part of the design, eventual design of their makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, he's Ace is a really good graphic artist. Mm. Yeah, it always yeah. always was from yeah. high school on. What did you think about his guitar playing at the time? He was uh, a very much a real fiery, um, powerful guitarist even early on. He's a great guitar player. Mm -hmm. Being a keyboard player that played a lot of very different music, I didn't really fit in with his uh, genre. Yeah. 
Uh, but he uh, he likes all kinds of music, and uh, but he is just a really great hard rock guitar player. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, he's he's one of the originals. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's get on and talk about how you got into the keyboards. How did you begin playing piano? Well, I played guitar first. Oh. I played guitar first, and I had about six months of lessons when I was about nine. Okay. From a nun that we used to like slap my hand <laughs> with a ruler. Yeah, Yard yeah. Stick. Well, 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 either that or actually would put coins on my hands, and if my pos piano position wasn't right, oh. she would the coins would fall off, and she'd keep my money. Oh. <laughs> so you know, I didn't last long. I lasted about six months, and that's the only lessons I ever really oh, had. Oh wow! Okay. Um, so it just came naturally to you after that? Well, yeah, but being a, someone who had a piano in the house, and my father was very musical, my brother was, um, I was uh, able to just sit at the piano and improvise, and I really liked being able to play some rock songs on yeah, it. Yeah. But I would also like improvise what sounded like very, very basic um, modal stuff like... Keith Jarrett or something like that. So what about playing me one of the early, very first songs that you learned? You know, what were you kind of playing oh. back then? Like, if you had to sort of think back and... Okay. Every morning... By the Kinks. Okay, yeah. Was, uh, so that was one of the first songs you learned. Yeah, actually, or, I learned on the guitar first, and then playing like uh, R and B songs. You okay. know. So you learned that first on the on the guitar, and then you how did you transition from the guitar to piano? Well, I wasn't the best guitarist. Okay. So we were like four guys in the band. One guy would sort of play a bass line, and we all plug into one twin reverb. Oh. Okay, with like a little <laughs> nine volt battery Lafayette mixer. Uh, stuck it to one channel. Ah, oh, the good old days, right? And, and it sounded horrible. <laughs> and I was not the best guitarist. And so I said, I had piano lessons when I was nine, okay? So, you know, I think I'll be, I'm going to save up and ask for, ask for some favors and get a, a little portable organ. There you go. All right. And, uh, and when I was in eighth grade uh, at the Catholic school I went to, the organist came by and said, who wants to learn how to play the organ? And we had... A magnificent, huge pipe organ oh. in, in this church. It was a great church, St. Philip Mary. And he said, well, who wants to learn how to play? I said, well, yeah, I play guitar. Sure, why not? And he took me over to the church, and he told me how to play the, these three songs for benediction as part of a Catholic service. Okay. Uh, Tanto Mergo, O Salutano Sostia, and then after a while, he says, well, you got it down. He says, well, you, know, you could play for benediction on Monday night. I said, wow, really? And, and I did, and it was a great thrill. And playing. you were a rock star then at that very moment. Yeah, but then I found out when I asked him, well, what else am I going to learn? He goes, just those three songs is fine. He just wanted me to play for benediction, so he went up to drive down <laughs> from Westchester, which was kind of a trip. He, had, he wanted me he to... He had ulterior motives. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, am I going to learn anything else? <laughs> He goes, no, that's good enough for now. That's funny. I said, I said, forget it after that. That's good. That's good. But then I started playing um, songs. And of course, being a, a keyboard player with a little electronic organ, mm -hmm. naturally gravitated towards the doors also. Oh, yeah. And, and um, I didn't read music. And um, so it was difficult with the, uh, some of the doors, uh, Ray Mandrick's keyboard parts, you know, when I had to, when I had to learn. So I had to learn it by by rote. So I put it on the turntable and I hear and that's the way we learned. Yes. Yeah. Well nowadays they have YouTube. Yeah, and, and you can just you can make a loop out of just anything oh. difficult and slow it down. Yeah, right. Wow. Boy, think about where you would have been had you been born in this era. Much lazier. <laughs> Much lazier. Yeah, I had to work at it. Yeah. Really work well at that's it. true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and that's what we all did. We all would put the vinyl on or listen to our favorite albums, yeah. favorite songs, and that's how you'd learn them. Lock myself in the, in, in the living room because uh, we, were, we were happy. 
But uh, he's not apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, were, dogs. <laughs> we were happy, but uh, yeah. we had nine people in two rooms in the Bronx there. And, wow. Uh, we had my uh, four boys in one room, and uh, my, my grandmother and two sisters in another room, and my parents slept in, in the uh, in the living room oh. on a sofa bed. Wow. So, but during the day, I go in there, and they had a lock on the door, and I go and and just crank up, you know, Janis Joplin albums and. Oh yeah. And Hendrix and whatever I could, because right. I was, I was, or the animals. I would play the animals over and over. Yeah, right. You know, uh, they had a great keyboard player. Yeah. So at some point, then you had to, you had to move on to bigger and better things. How eventually? It's not easy to move a piano. Were you just moving the the small keyboards yeah, around, or did you finally small. graduate to something bigger? Finally, finally uh, found a guy that owned a record store on Fordham Road, who had a. a um, a, a version of a B3, okay. Hammond B3, yeah. And I used to like me and my friends would like haul it down the subway stairs and 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 put it over the turnstile and go to gigs. So how far did you have to cart this thing? About eight blocks to the subway station, oh. and then on to down to the subway stairs. But I remember one time we played uh, at All Hollows High School on 164th Street, and we were opened up for the Vagrants, who was. Uh, who had a great guitarist named Leslie West, and who later went on to Mountain. Okay. And so there were there were some great, great uh, bands back there. Right, right. So you were really in the heart of at least part of the heart of New York City, where all of this music was happening. Yeah, uh, and I got I got to include my favorite band back then, and still one of my favorite bands was the Blues Magoos. The Blues Magoos. The huh? Blues Magoos. We ain't got nothing yet. Okay. We ain't got nothing yet. Okay. We ain't got nothing yet. yet. Yeah. But that was it. That was what they had. They just that, uh, that was it. <laughs> I want to back up. I'm trying to envision you and your buds, your 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 entourage, moving this Hammond B3. How much did this thing weigh? I mean, it, it's, I don't know. It was just, might as well have been a ton. You really must have wanted it to have to move this yeah. thing around like that. Yeah, and. Um, I just loved playing, and it, oddly enough, it wasn't so much performing at dances or mixers. I loved just rehearsing. I just loved learning stuff, and hanging with my friends. We became really tight. We had this one rehearsal place we all chipped in for on Fordham Road, and it was called we called it the Electronic Church of the Sacrificial Lamb. My friend Bob Pagani started it, wow. and um, we would play like 14 hours a day. And whoever was there, whatever in, instrument, or, whatever instrumentalists weren't there, I would play that instrument. I'd sit in the drums for a while, I'd play guitar for a while, and, and go into keyboards for a while, and everybody else would switch around. Yeah. And so you learned a lot about arranging. It's not that I became a great drummer, but I learned a lot about um, how things interact. Right. And that is, I think, what I appreciate the most about that time. Right. A lot of your credits uh, that I've read are, uh, has to do with uh, compositions and arrangements, that kind of thing. So, I've done some of that, not so yeah. much in the, all the big hits. Okay. Not not so much, you know. I, I didn't arrange anything on uh, David Bowie's album or or Madonna Like a Virgin. Right. But I but I I kept on getting asked back because I would always put myself into the mix because I love pop music, I love vocal music, mm -hmm. and I would do my best to support the vocal. Back in the 70s, the early 70s, going into the disco era. I want to know how you got connected with Nile Rodgers because his guitar playing is, is so representative of that genre and that era. It is. It's, it, it, they're synonymous. That kind of, the really kind are. of hardcore, exciting grooves yeah. that we existed back then are synonymous with Nile's guitar playing. So was, and Bernard's bass playing. Right. So when you connected with them in some way, was that your first big break or was there something? Yes. Yeah? Yes, it was. I was playing, I was in the house band at Max's Kansas City, okay. which is a, a little bit up from CBGB's in Lower East Side. Right. A lot of big guys used to come in, Iggy Pop, and uh, the Ramones would come in after playing somewhere else and mm -hmm. they would come into this dance club. And um, So this is about when? This is 75. Okay. Sometime around 76, maybe. Um... And Niall and Bernard were looking for a keyboard player like me, specifically. You know, they were looking for a guy who played rock and roll, but had a sense of R&B, who had a sense of playing with an R&B band. Yeah. 
And they asked for my number that night. And they, they saw me playing in Max, Kansas City. And then I never heard from them. And I was like, oh, I, I guess maybe they found somebody else or whatever. But then right across the street from me on Decatur Avenue in the Bronx was a guitarist named uh, Eddie Martinez, who was a phen phenomenal legend in his own right. Uh, guitarist played with so many big bands, started out with uh, Nona Hendrix and uh, Patti LaBelle and, and went on to play with Steve Winwood and um, with Lenny White. Mm. Uh, he played with, and he's a phenomenal guitar player. He used to put his Marshall outside the window, you know, oh, and you could hear him playing. He heard me playing. Oh. And, um, and he came, rang my bell, and he said, listen, my friend Niall, they need a keyboard player. I think it's for some, made for someone like you. They had a guy, but they lost his number. <laughs> it was that you? Yeah. Oh, they, had a, they had a guy that thought it would be perfect, but they lost his number. So here's the address, go down for an audition. And just to meet with him. And I went down, I walk in the room, they go, that's the guy. That's the guy. Hey, you're the guy. <laughs> that's the guy. That's and great. it was an instant, uh, beautiful relationship. It's very fortunate. They're incredibly well-schooled players, super intelligent, mm -hmm. super um, uh, natural at getting grooves going and a sense of style. Niall was, uh, and Bernard were great at every kind of music. Uh, Niall first started out playing classical clarinet. Classical clarinet. He played clarinet, played classical guitar. He was one of the first uh, musicians on Sesame Street. He uh, did lessons at the Jazzmobile, which would go around. Um, he has a really fascinating background. I can't go into it because it would take an hour <laughs> just talking about how he grew up with uh, uh, intellectuals from the, from the uh, Greenwich Village beatnik community uh, coming into his house. You know, he'd have uh, Thelonious Monk oh. would be at his house. And oh, my God. Yeah, j j great jazz players and uh, the great beat poets would be over his house. His parents Ginsburg were part of that community. Ginsburg and all those guys? His parents were part of that community. So, wow. So he grew up uh, with that. And... Uh, we, we had a great time. We were called the Big Apple Band before we were chic. Oh, okay. Because they were with a, a opening, they were the backing band for uh, New York City, a band called New York City. Okay. So they were called the Big Apple Band. So I heard Niall tell the story once about how they changed the name to chic. Do you remember why? Well, I, it had something to do with hearing Roxy music. Yes. Uh, because they decided they wanted to be to funk and dance music, what Roxy music was to, to white pop music. Because Roxy music had the style down. Yes. They were consistent in their musical style and their visual style. And uh, Niall is very much that way, and Bernard. And they wanted to be this very sophisticated group. Yeah. And uh, they changed the name from the Big Apple Band to Chic. And um, which is interesting also, talking, we talked about Kiss before, they also, there was a, an influence from having a, a four-letter name. Four-letter name. That's yeah. exactly yeah. right. I heard that same story. I thought it was, it was great because he mentioned Roxy yeah. because it was four letters. Yeah. And then he also mentioned Kiss. And I went, wait a minute. Nile Rogers talking yeah. about. Well, because I, I talked to him about Kiss and before yeah. they were big famous. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, but I was just very fortunate to meet up with Nile. Yeah. And they did me a solid because I had my own band on Electra at the time. Also, besides doing all the studio work with them, uh, the band was called the Sims Brothers Band, and we mm. had two albums out on Electra. But I wrote for that. I okay. didn't write the kind of music Nile and Bernard wrote. Okay. So I wanted to continue, and we had a number one record, and I had to go tell them, listen, I got to pursue this dream of mine of being, yeah. you know, uh, someone that writes this kind of music. Right. And they said, God bless you, go for it, but you'll always be our piano player. Here's Rob's band playing one of the Sims Brothers band's songs live in the Treehouse recently at my home base in the Rink Studios. Here's Back to School.
Robert Sabino. And they just stuck with me. I mean, I, I, I would really work hard at playing gigs in all over New England and driving back and doing a session for Niall Bernard as part of Chic. For uh, years I did that. And uh, they stuck by me. Uh, they're very loyal people. I did all the Chic albums and went on to their other projects with, uh, with Debbie Harry and, um, and Madonna and... And so Niall was involved in those yeah. as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Power Station, that was Bernard. Okay. That was Bernard's band um, that he produced and played for also. But that, was, that came about because uh, Duran Duran were such huge Chic fans. They came oh. to New York specifically because they wanted to work with Chic. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Huh. Hardcore Chic fans. <laughs> One of the most interesting stories about Duran Duran and Chic and myself is that we had finished re-recording at the power station. That was the studio in New York. And that's where we did all our recording. And afterwards, uh, Duran Duran was um, going to be at the garden. And they invited Niall and Bernard to come play. And we were in the middle of doing Madonna. And they left. Not was, Madonna, like doing Madonna. Yes. In the middle of, we've got to yes. clarify. Well, I'm clarifying. Because that, we, that could have been. We were, record, know, <laughs> we were recording the very first Madonna, the very, not the very first, but the, uh, the big hit the album. The big hit album, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, right after Borderline. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, the day went to, to, to play with Duran Duran, and I was waiting for a cab, and Madonna said, they all left. I got to go. I really, really want to go. I was saying, oh, I'm so tired. I don't want to go. Come on, Madonna. And she was probably, you got to take me. got to take me. Okay, fine. So we went over to the garden, and we had some comps and some passes. And I'll never forget when we came out from the backstage area, and we walked down the side to go to our comp seats, and there was some young girls in the audience for Duran Duran that recognized Madonna because she was such, so... Um, hard to miss and, and the videos that she did. Right. She was so... She had explosive. all the loose clothing then too, right, at the time? Yes, yeah, on the first two videos of her, the album before us. Yeah. And they shouted out her name, Madonna, Madonna. And, I, and, and she looked at me and she goes, do you think I'll ever play a place like this? This big? And I was like, sure kid, yeah. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I mean, wow. you certainly have, she certainly had the ambition. Right. And, and she had the drive and the, the business acumen, and, and she knew what she wanted. She went for it. But anyway, so I heard, that, you know, it was amazing that she wasn't sure if she would be that successful. Well, she was driven, and she obviously had some confidence, but I think like a lot of, like a lot of artists, there is that self-doubt maybe a little bit, and there. yes. there's that insecurity that... What is it like for you to look back at some of these artists that you were connected with early on before they really shot into the stratosphere? Well, only a few like that. Most of the ones I was with were already huge. I mean, I got a chance, except for Madonna, but I got a chance to work with David Bowie, and I got to work on Mick Jagger's solo album, and then I got called in for a uh, connection with Niall to work with Paul Simon. Wow. On a couple of songs, and Paul and I just really hit it off because they're both New Yorkers, and he was just the nicest guy and a real musician's musician. Yeah. yeah. And we're in the middle of recording. Uh, I forget the studio we're at. It wasn't a power station. But uh, he started uh, talking to me. He says, "You know, what are you doing this summer?" I was like, "I don't know. What are you doing, Paul?" <laughs> and he said, "You know that Central Park gig we did, the reunion of Simon and Garfunkel." But well, we're going to do a whole tour of that, Ooh. and uh, through the uh, a summer tour. And I, she says, "You think you want to like come and uh, play?" Wow. I said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I was shaking. And I said, "Yeah, sure, I think so." And um, I was just thrilled to do well, that. Well, and they had such a huge following back then. Yeah. Huge. What, what a gift. I mean, I love great songwriting, and I got to work and actually, and even help participate in some crafting of sections with one of the finest composers I, I, I had the privilege of knowing and hearing. 
Yeah, talking about Paul Simon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Um, there's a song that I play, and I don't remember, I think it was off of one of his solo albums that I, I love to play. It's uh, the song Kodachrome. Oh, yeah. I love that song. I don't know if you played on that album or not. No, no. I yeah. just, actually, I only played one album with him, and, but I toured with him. Okay. All I right. toured with Simon and Garfunkel. Okay. I also toured with Chess Paul Simon, and I also toured with Chess Art Garfunkel. Oh, mm -hmm. How did you get connected with David Bowie? Was that also Nile? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Nile played a huge role in your... Oh, yeah. He, like I said, he's incredibly loyal to me and, and trusted me because he knew I loved pop music. He knew I loved supporting mm -hmm. the vocal and the song. That was paramount to me, just like it was to him. Right. Nothing, showing off your chops and showing off what you can do in a certain section was not as important as contributing to keeping the song uh, stable and keeping the song focused on what was important in that song. On the Bowie album. Which album was this? On the uh, uh, Let's Dance. Okay. On the Let's Dance album, um, oh, he was there the first day, and I hadn't met him before, and we wanted to do Modern Love, and he wanted me to do, to tool around with doing like a Jerry Lee Lewis rock and roll piano on that. Okay, but during the whole song, uh, I said, you know, David, I love your voice. I love how you can hear the depth of your voice. And I'm just going to play that Jerry Lee Lewis stuff on the chorus and leave it open. I'm going to go, bam. It's modern and and I don't know all the words, the words. And each verse, I would add just one chord. And he did a, a vocal, rough vocal, and he said, you're right. He goes, and I was able to, I, he had me for the rest of the album because he saw that I was forehead. You were thinking. I was thinking of him yes. as the artist, and Niall knew that's what I, that's what I did. That's why I knew I was, Niall was loyal to me is because I would do whatever it took. So was Modern Love the only song that you played on? No, I played on, on all the, the rest album. of the songs. Really? I got the rest of it because I stuck yes. to my guns on that and showed that I was four hit. Wow. That's, and what an amazing album. What was that, 84, 83? Yeah, 83, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that was another it all, one. It all blurs. It does, well, even it's, for me. I mean, I can only imagine for you. We were doing so much work at the same time, too. We were doing Madonna and this and that, and Power Station, and Fred came after that. Yeah. What, what, what was the big hit? There were probably one or two big hits off of Power Station. I remember they had a... Bang a Gong. Oh, yes, that's right. Bang a Gong. I remember that. I mean, to be honest, I don't remember which songs I played in that. Yeah. Because there, yeah. there were two keyboard players. Okay, all right. And uh, I played on a couple of songs, but I... Yeah. Yeah. It's a long time ago. And so even despite all of this, you still managed to eventually play on a hard rock album, like with Ace Fraley, your yeah. old buddy, your yeah. old neighborhood buddy. Uh, Fraley's Comet? No, Which I contributed to that. I don't know if I okay. played anything. It's funny, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't remember either. Because <laughs> if you look on the album, it says, Con Contributor. Okay. Rob Sabino, Contributor. Right. And I was like, okay. I don't... What does that mean? I think during the working of the album... and. I would suggest here's what the part should be. Oh, okay. You know, I helped him like with a little okay. arrangement stuff, and that I think that's what he meant by contributor. Okay. But I played, I played in a couple of things. I just played with him just a couple of years ago on one of his albums. Um, Space just, Invader, or I don't remember. Oh, okay, All right. but it was it was just two summers ago. Okay. okay. And and uh, it was at a studio in Turlock, of all places. Really? Yeah. A buddy of his who collected guitars with uh, had a studio huh. in, in in the middle of his farm, and it was really great. And it was away from all the distractions. And yeah. and um, was it a cover that you played, or was it an original? It was it was original, and there was one cover I think too. Okay, all right. Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, but I I uh, 
run into him every once in a while. Yeah. Because he's, uh, you know, you go back so far with some, with some right. people, you got to stay in touch. Well, I think that's great that you do keep in touch because so often, whether you're a celebrity, whether you're in the music business, acting, or you're just an ordinary Joe, you have these friendships that go back a long way, but it takes effort to maintain them. You can't yeah. just you can't just forget about them. You yeah. have to make the effort to call, and yeah. that's really great that you guys have maintained that friendship. Yeah, but I've but I haven't been that way with everybody, and I've lost uh, contact with some people yeah. that I, I was really tight with. I, yeah. I haven't talked to Peter Frampton in a while. I was lucky to work with him. Um, but my own band, we opened up for him on a tour in '78. Oh, okay. Uh, that band, the Simmons Brothers band, uh, we won some you know best band in the state type contest by having our friends stuff the ballot box. And, <laughs> and one of the prizes was to open up for a national recording act at wow. the New Haven Coliseum. Okay. And it was Peter Frampton, wow. and Peter came out and heard us, and he really was for we were a good band, huh. and we had some really good songs uh, and. Uh, and Peter, Peter just loved us and was having problems with his opening act. Hmm. And problems back then before digital technology was usually that they kept up changing the mixing, monitor mixing situation. Oh, okay. And set up stuff because they wanted the show to get to be really smooth. So um, that night, he says, what are you guys doing Thursday? I know, what are you doing? Another one of those things like happened with Paul Simon. Yeah. He goes, I'm playing Madison Square Garden, come and open up for me. Holy smoke. So our second big gig ever was in Madison Square Garden. Wow. Garden. And we became friends and we, we worked together on a couple of different projects. And um, then when I came out here, I uh, started teaching at uh, UC Davis. I teach the history of rock and roll. I've been teaching there for about 12 years now. Uh, that was 16. I think it's 16 years. Wow. And uh, my fifth or sixth year there, um, the chair of the department asked if I wanted to bring in any guest people to like to be a guest lecturer. And I thought of Peter, I asked Peter, and he said, sure. That's fantastic. So I had Peter come out to uh, UC Davis and, uh, and uh, guest lecturer class, and he loved it. He said it was, it was really neat. Unfortunately, I, you know, he didn't want to just come and play. Because, you know, he's a total pro and he wanted to be prepared. Yeah. I, I, and one of the kids in the class had to, here, just me, here's my guitar. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and he was like, oh, okay. Oh, and man. He, but he, he obliged and he was very gracious. He's That's a, great. He's a really cool guy. He's a, a remarkable musician. One of the reasons why he's still around, is, and even though he's having physical problems mm. now, is because he always needed to... Um, and he always understood that he was a musician and a singer first. Even though he was the biggest star in the world at one point with his Frampton live album. comes alive, yeah. Yeah, biggest star in the world. Yeah. And he was a star when he was a kid. He was the face of, on, on like the Inquirer, you know, a, a child star. A uh, prodigy, right? Yeah, he was a prodigy when, yeah. he, was, when he was young. Yeah. And then went into a band called The Herd. And then into... Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm not Humble good. Pie. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, humble pie. And um, he just wanted to be a really good singer and a really good guitar player. Yeah, and, that's, and that's why when he fell down from being number one in the world, it didn't get to him like it got to other star, superstars because he was happy playing better and singing better all mm -hmm. the time. And he got better and better. Yeah. As he yeah. Well, he's, he was on his retirement tour yeah. just recently. Yeah. yeah. So... What I have here in my hand, Robert Sabino, are some reviews of your class over there at UC Davis. Oh. Have you seen these? Okay, so some. <laughs> so this one says, uh, this is the best class at UC Davis. Three exclamation points, by yeah. the way. Uh, Rob is the greatest teacher. He's funny and makes the class so much fun. And at the bottom it says, uh, he really wants to make sure that students learn and have fun in his class. Um, another one says, this is the best GE class at UC Davis. Another one says, uh, the man got Peter Frampton as a guest speaker, exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> so you have, uh, you have a four point, uh, what is it here? A 4.6 out of five as an overall teacher in class. Yeah. That's pretty but good. It's, it's kind of a low bar. So you teach rock and roll. <laughs> you, know, you know who else has that high rating? Who's that? 
a, a friend of ours who's the head of the beer brewing department. Oh. <laughs> so the rock and roll guy and beer, and the beer. beer guy. You guys need to get together, form your own band. Actually, this man is a genius. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he really is. He, he, I mean, and that's an important department there. You know, winemaking and beer making and is beer. huge out here, and he is a very influential man. Anyway. Yes, indeed. But I think that's cool. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, you've got all this history, all this experience, and you're able to relate that to students here Yeah, for the last 16 years. Yeah, well, I just make sure they understand that the importance of rock and roll because I think it's very important. Uh, when I was starting out in bands, going to the Fillmore East, um, I really relished how eclectic it was. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much by going to concerts for three, for $4 or $5 and seeing uh, The Who and Ravi Shankar and, Tim, uh, and <laughs> Tim Hart and Neil right. together. Uh, you know, a folk artist, uh, one of the greatest classical Indian yeah. musicians and The Who together for $5. You, you know, but there, was, there was no shock at that no. back then. It was like, you know, no, these are people that, these are artists that are, are important to the population that went to the Fillmore East. It was, and, and I think even more so, I think all of that helped set the foundation for what America is today. It was that acceptance mm -hmm. of different cultures and that acceptance through, through music and art. And also it was so inexpensive to put on a show then that um, artists would go there and if they weren't really on, uh, they didn't get automatic encores. Oh, yeah. See, if you had a brand new band that nobody ever heard of and they just killed it, they'd keep on bringing them back for encores. And then it didn't matter, didn't matter who it was, if it was, you know, the Yardbirds or, or um, Crosby, Sills, and Nash, if they weren't on that night, it'd be like, okay. Because, Next. <laughs> yeah, be because you didn't... Uh, you didn't bring it. You, you, you didn't bring it that night and... Um, they didn't save their big hits for the encores, the automatic encores, because every show has automatic encores now. That's kind of the routine. You because, work it in. Because people are, are paying, you know, $100 to go see it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how kids today do it. I, I mean, don't know. I don't know. know either. I want to get back to talking about uh, the David Bowie album as well as the Mick Jagger album. What was those experiences like? Let's start with David Bowie. When you think back to those days... Uh, were there any challenges that, that faced and you just didn't know how to, like, but it worked out, but you weren't sure how it was going to work out? No, I, uh, I'm supremely confident that it was going to be great because David had these incredible songs. Uh, between him and Al, they had done pre-production to work out exactly how it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then he, Niall hired all musicians he trusted. So any little bits here and there that we would, that we would add, he was like, that's why they're here. That's 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 why they're here. What a bunch of fun that must have been. Oh yeah, it was such a gas, and it went and we did we did it so quickly. Um, we, Diana Ross, we did the big comeback album for her. I think we did the whole album in three weeks. You know. Wow. Um, wow. What was that like working with someone, Diana Ross? Well, because they trusted Niall so much. I just met her a couple of times. She wasn't there for a lot of the recording. Okay. We just did the recordings, and she came in and sang. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So you were, it was kind of like you were your own wrecking crew. Yes. You, you, Niall, you yeah. and Bernard and all those guys. If you like, look on the back of Sister Sledge, we are family. Yeah. It says a chic production. Wow. You know, it, it wasn't just our names. It was a chic production. I heard that that area of New York City at the time when Sister Sledge came out, they really were family. Yeah. And that everybody who worked with them was considered sort of this family unit. They were, they were remarkable. Every person that the Nile has worked with, that I've worked with, with Nile, have been good people who knew they were getting into a family type situation. Mm. Uh, Sister Sledge was like that. Uh, Debbie Harry from Blondie, we did her solo album. On that album, Debbie Harry, who's great, you know, one of the stellar people of early punk, you know, played at CBGB's at the beginning. Oh, yeah. She um, would come in, this person who's known as this great beauty and a great uh, punk artist, would come in and each day say, would say, oh, 
Okay, so today I made carrot cake. What about tomorrow? Does anybody want anybody? Because I, you know, I would really do good at brownies too. And she would bring things into the studio. It was like, it was we were just like family, and just like having a, a good time. We, come to think of it, food was a big part of some production. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, on yeah. on Let's Dance with Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh. Stevie Ray Vaughan. We weren't getting something. Stevie sent down for, I think he sent down for ribs, and we we all sat around having ribs. And we played some basketball and, and it got back and we got this one song, I forget what song it was, in like one take. Uh, because we all trusted each other and listened to right. that. So we're gonna get we're gonna eat ribs and we're gonna get the track better because of that. Yep. Well, your fingers were all greased up. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, we're relaxed. Yeah. That meat's sinking to your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So Mick, what was it like recording with Mick? Oh, he's, he's a legend, very humble man, a hard worker. Uh, he would be the first one there and last to leave. Mm. And sober, uh, hardworking, uh, helpful, uh, collaborative. The only problem I ever had with Mick is uh, when my older brother, who was a stockbroker, very successful stock trader at the time, okay. his, her, his secretary was a big, big Jagger oh. fan, so he just walked into this power station and he's in his cashmere coat and everything, and she all dressed up. And he said, "I'm here to I'm here to see Rob Sabino. He's in the Mick Jagger room." So, sure, absolutely, come here. Let me open the door for you. And he's behind the glass there, and I'm out at out at, at the piano with Mick, going there and say, "Oh, he wants me to do it like this." And and then he looks around. and He goes, "Oh man, these guys from the record company that keep on dropping by." And I, and I look around and I go, oh, Mick, I'm, "Mick, I'm sorry." It's my brother. I don't know how we got on here. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking for another client. <laughs> yeah, I, no, he's just he had, had a, an awe, mm. an, an aura of importance about him. Yeah, yeah, and he's a really cool guy. Yeah, and he just he just everybody figured he belonged there. Yeah, yeah, play the role. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Um, is there anything that you haven't done in your career that it's like that one thing that that you know, before I, you know, that bucket list kind of thing that you really well, want something to something is never going to happen, to collaborate with Joni Mitchell. <laughs> oh, my God, yes. <laughs> you don't think that'll ever happen? Has no. she done recording? Is that why? No, because even if she, she might, she might do some more, some more. Who knows? But one thing for sure, the list of performers who clamor to play with her mm. is long and uh, is is a wide list, a long well, list. Well, I, uh, I actually met Joni Mitchell a few years ago. Oh, I'm jealous. Yeah, she was. I didn't really get a chance to speak with her at length, but she was inducted into the California uh, Hall of Fame, and uh, and I was the the announcer, and I was part of the show, and so uh, yeah, I got to meet her just very briefly, and that was really cool. That yeah, it was really cool. And also, never having worked with any of the Beatles. Oh, yeah. But that's, you know, I, I don't have much to complain about. I've worked with some of the biggest artists ever. Yes, you have. And, and I'm complaining about not working. I never got to work with the Beatles. Well, you know, not many people <laughs> not have. Not many people have. <laughs> you know, but in New York, actually, a lot of people work with Lennon because Lennon was just another New Yorker. Right. That was one of the beauties of John Lennon. He walked up and down the street and yeah. people knew. He would, you know, he would have the stroller out there in Central Park and people would say, hey, John, that's why he loved New York. He loved New York because other parts of the country and even in Europe, but it was John Lennon. And, but in the Upper West Side, mm. it was just John. That's, and he lived in the, the Dakota building, yeah. right? Right yeah. there. What about Carol King? Yeah, another person I'd love to, another, another New Yorker. But that. you'd have to sit side by side on the yeah. bench yeah. or have well, dueling pianos. But you know, she's, she's, a great, she's a great collaborator from early on. Yeah. And so that would be wonderful to do that. But people have mistaken ideas about her. Also, she's a really intuitive, great musician, great song crafts person. But you know, when people come up to her at concerts and say, you know, you know, when they say, working now on the morning rain, I used to be, and I said, you, that song. You did, Carol, inspire me and maybe get through my second divorce. And, and I, you know, you just meant so much to me as a woman. And, and then Carol would say, well, thank you very much, but a man wrote the lyrics. Oh, man. Jerry Goffin, her husband. Oh. Her husband wrote the words. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jeez. 
Wow. Hey, I can't believe works. I had the wrong chords today. We're not the morning. There we go. Okay. There you go. That was a huge album. That yeah. that one that she had. Uh, what was the name of that album? Tapestry. Tapestry. Yes. Huge. 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 What about Elton? I'm just curious. Boy, I, yeah, I would. I, I adore everything he ever did. His quickness and his sense of melody. And his soul. Uh, talk, it's interesting talking about Elton. There's a picture I could show you on Facebook of uh, all the guys in Chic with Elton. Because Elton is the biggest Chic fan. Oh. He, Elton came to a, 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 a concert and they did all the, um, the uh, sound check and it's a rehearsal with Elton playing piano. Yeah. And, uh, so where were you? I mean, uh, well, I was. This, I mean, this is a, this is just like a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. Because right. Sheik actually with Nile, the way he's going now, this is huge. What he is doing now, he's on everybody's list now. Ever since Daft Punk, you know, um, he's uh, running songwriting workshops. He's uh, on tour for everybody. They're coming back to uh, Golden One Center to open up for Cher. Oh, yeah. In May. I just heard about her new her new tour. Yeah, yeah. and uh, also um, you see now did something else recently. Oh yeah, he's <laughs> on the like the board of Abbey Road Studios. Oh man, yeah, he does workshops and symposiums there, and he's a, on staff there at yeah. Abbey, you know, and it, it, that really kills me when people talk about. That disco band. Oh yeah, they're not disco. The disco band. I mean, they're, well, we were. Yeah, and, and I'm proud of it. But so much more than that. Yeah, and proud of it. Uh, Tony Thompson, our drummer, who did, was sad he died a few years back. Um, Tony Thompson, our drummer, was a middle class black guy from Queens who grew up didn't play Led Zeppelin like crazy. Man, uh, you know, and uh, this drummer and Nile and myself. You were, we could do anything. Yeah. Well, and I heard uh, Niall talk about how the fact that he doesn't like being pigeonholed or having Sheik being pigeonholed as just a Sheik, or having Sheik just be a disco band, that it's so much deeper than that. Yeah. There's so much more to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, he's a, a consummate musician. You yeah. Know, he he sure. can conduct an orchestra. You know, yeah. he's. <laughs> yeah. So now you are um, the musical director over here at the local. Church that yeah, you belong to. At Holy Trinity Church. Yeah. And I love it. And here's Rob one more time performing Kingdom of God with the Ain't Got No Time Rock and Blues Band. And it can only be heard and seen here, recorded live at the Treehouse at my home base, the Rink Studios in Sacramento, California. We all need a place where we learn to love, some place to know all our own. And all of us here must do what we can to proclaim where we belong the kingdom of god we all need a place who can learn to hear someone who knows how we feel and all of us here must do what we can to proclaim that one is here the kingdom of God. We need some shelter from the storms.
Sabino on the, the incomparable Rob Sabino on the hey, keyboards thanks. and vocals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Rob, that was awesome. It'll be even better the third time. I often tell the story of the two times where I got the hairs on my arms sticking up. Yeah. The first time was playing with Simon and Garfunkel and we were on tour and we played in Israel. Ooh. We played in Tel Aviv and played this big soccer stadium and the sun's going down over the Mediterranean and the place is packed with people and with lighters going back and forth. And Paul starts. Hello, not to smile, friend. And he, he starts that. And, and, and I start hearing these people from Arab nations and from Israel and from uh, around the Mediterranean, all singing in English, all singing the song. And I look up and I say, how did I get here? What did, what did I do to deserve this? This is scary. That I don't, I do not deserve this. I'm noticing no false humility. Nobody deserves to have this sense of peace and calm and, and fulfillment. And I felt that. I said, this is what I was meant to be. I, I had no choice in it. I was just drawn here. That was a spiritual moment. Wasn't it? it was a spiritual moment. And the only other time I had that was when I left rock and roll. And I, I was at my first Catholic church in Auburn. First Christmas there. And the place is packed, and I had a really nice choir. And I'm at the organ, a big, powerful organ. I'm playing, we're doing the last song, doing Joy to the World, and people are standing up and singing. And I got the same thing. The hairs on my arms are getting up, and I said, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. This is what I was meant to be. So twice, once with Simon and Garfunkel, I once playing at this regular old church in Auburn. Yeah, yeah. And I had that same feeling of, I don't deserve this. So what does that tell you about music as a, as a whole? That it is something that enters the soul of people and causes them to have emotions well up in them that can be used for good. I was playing at the church in Davis, at the Episcopal Church, and the other music director was a brilliant singer named Sarah Eyerly. She was studied at The Hague, and she's, she's, she is now a, a professor of music in Florida. She's got her doctorate, and she's just an incredibly beautiful soprano and well-versed in all kinds of musicology. And she was in the back of the church, and she had stayed to hear the end of the service I was doing. And I had the kids, doing, the kids in the adults' choir doing Amazing Grace, an arrangement of Amazing Grace. And she was in the back, and I went up to her, and she was still standing there. And she said, she was bawling. This person is a consummate musician. She was just crying. And, and she said, that was one of the most beautiful things I ever heard. And she, goes, and she said, thank you very much. I said, in all sincerity, that has nothing to do with me. Because if it were like something on autopilot, then everybody here would be having the same emotion. It's something in you that made you feel that emotion because it, it doesn't happen to everybody. Music is given so much credit um, for being able to bring different groups of people together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that universal music in a way, yeah. that universal message, if you will. But it, that is what I think why I really love different kinds of music, even though I primarily listen to rock and roll, but I... I can appreciate and enjoy music of most genres, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I grew up, uh, my, my mom had uh, albums in there from 
you know, from Elvis. She saw Elvis live, and she, uh, Carol King, and mm -hmm. she, she had all those albums. Even the Carpenters, one of the most beautiful voices in pop music, it was Karen Carpenter. So I mean, just smooth. I 100% agree with her. She's wow. actually one of my heroes. Is she? Man, yeah. yeah. And then my dad, who was a professional musician, for he uh, played in the NORAD band. He played the French horn, trombone, and trumpet, and toured around the world before I was even born. Um, but he had all of that kind of music as well as a lot of classical and things. So I grew up listening to such a wide variety of music. And then, of course, um, uh, going to college and taking different kinds of cultural communications classes. We studied different kinds of music mm -hmm. uh, and, and what it means to different cultures. So um, I, I love it all, really. Yeah. You know, I just like, wish I could play it as well you as you and the others can't do. Can't go wrong. No, can't go wrong. Just no. loving it. So, what's next for you? What's your uh, you, you, when Niall comes back through town? You going to get on stage with him? Oh, I don't know. That's it's difficult to do because he's not the headliner. So, if you're not the headliner, it's hard to have control over things. Mm. He's a gracious man. He would if, if up to him. I'm sure it'd be fine. Maybe it would be. Mm. But he was great. It was great going up on stage with him when they opened it for Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm. That was a thrill going up there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I don't know, but I, I just want to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I'll be, I'll be right there. Um, any final thoughts on you know looking no. back and you know all these wonderful experiences you've had over the years? No, but I just want to thank you for bringing this out, for bringing out the stories of musicians, mm -hmm. and because this is what inspires the next musicians. For sure, and that will inspire more people. What would you tell people, um, young musicians who are struggling to make it these days? My same advice I give all the time, same thing I say over and over again. I got to be pretty good at what I do because I would never join a band unless I were convinced that everybody else in the band was better than me. Hmm. You cannot go wrong with that advice. You might find out in six months that well, maybe it's really not that great. You know, I think I'll move on. But... If you say, man, these guys floor me, I want to play with them, I can learn so much from them, then you can't go wrong by saying, I don't want to go with a band that people aren't as good as I am, right. or just on the same level. I want to go with a band where I think, my God, what I could learn from that guitar player. I'm going to challenge you. Yeah. 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 Robert Sabino, you're a legend in Thank my you. mind. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> All right. God bless. Thank God you. bless. Thank you. So every now and then, when Niall comes through Sacramento, they try to get together, and Rob's even joined Niall on stage for a song or two. Man, I'd love to be there when that happens again. To capture that reunion, two longtime friends and musicians with that history, absolutely incredible. I want to, again, thank Rob for letting us invade his home, taking over his music room, and interrupting family time. I certainly appreciate it. And my thanks to you for checking out Sharky's Treehouse. I produce these episodes for musicians and music lovers alike. There's a story behind every band and every song, and I try to get these guys to share them with you. And who knows, maybe one of these young bands, maybe your band, can learn a little bit from these legends. And just maybe it can help them realize their dreams. For now, I'm Sharky, and remember, never forget how much music makes life more meaningful. See you soon in another episode of Sharky's Treehouse. Oh, God. Robert Sabino. <laughs> <laughs>